when I do meditation things, I'm usually sharing something that I'm experimenting or learning from or guiding. So it's not like being an expert, but it's something that is alive for me. So, you know, one time I, I taught mudras because that's what was happening with my body, right? Like moving, you know, making the, the hands do certain gestures that can move energy around. Other times I'm really into compassion. So right now um, I'm doing this body awareness. So let's get ready. Being in the room. Sorry, with the sounds of the world. So let's just take a moment to be aware of the sounds that are inside the room and sounds that you hear outside, just as a warm up. So wherever you are in your life, you can take a moment and say, my meditation object right now is sound, whether they're pleasant, neutral, or unpleasant. It's like you can be meditating for 30 seconds when you just pay attention to sound. So now let's take a brush about the size of you know four fingers uh, together like that, like a palm. We're going to start at the top of the head. So imagine a paint that's kind of has the viscosity of, of thick paint, right? And then with that brush, imagine somebody's brushing awareness on the right side of your forehead. So we're focusing on the surface of our bodies and our experience. And now you take that brush on the top of the head and you slide it from top to bottom, covering your head. So you go from the center to your neck. And this brush is painting this awareness, the, the shell, if we were an egg, I'm just going to pay attention to how this awareness now is moving from the left side of our skull, going down, what are the sensations that are felt in that ear, now we go back to the front, to the other side of the forehead. Just imagine a brush, if you've ever had a facial and they put a mask on. See what would, what would be covered, your nose, the lips, what are the sensations that are being felt on the cheeks? And with those three inches of awareness move to the right side of your neck, as you slide this brush, go to the other side or the front of the neck. So now give another big coat to the whole head. You're just covering the head with this awareness, like that is your meditation object nothing to accomplish, nothing to do. Just feeling the surface of the head. And we're moving to the right shoulder, sliding that brush at the top of the shoulder. Now you take the brush and you move it on the left shoulder. Now move it from shoulder to shoulder in the front of your body, clavicle in the back, 
So we're looking at the upper back. And now the right arm, the upper arm is being brushed with awareness. So just think you're having this brush. What would you feel if it's being brushed with something? You have the elbow. The forearm. Slide awareness up and down until you cover all the circumference. Now the hand and the palm and give it a second coat so that you're not missing any part of the right arm giving this loving, simple attention to the right arm. And now the left arm is feeling envious. It's like, come to me. So we move that brush, upper forearm. Like see how would you move that brush? It's like vertical or horizontal so that you're moving that awareness. Sure, the elbow is covered. The forearm, both sides of the forearm, the wrist, the hand, fingers, the palm. And now give it a second coat, removing the whole left arm, is being brushed with awareness. It's kind of a thick liquid of awareness where you're like this is what it feels like to have a left arm if you have a left arm right so we take our brush back to our neck we're going to move to our upper chest and the right side just imagine somebody's painting that part of your body and you move to the other side. Just noticing again, is it neutral? Can you feel something? Sometimes parts of the body don't give a lot of information. So you move to the chest, to the right side of the abdomen, the right side of the belly. And now decide, do you want to have the awareness go up and down or have the brush go sideways? How are you doing this painting of awareness? If you can't connect to the brush thing, it's fine. Just do however you do body awareness. So left side of the chest. Again, are you going to go vertical or horizontal? with doing a scanning of the surface of your body. The skin, what is it touching? It's the biggest organ in our system. The belly on the left side. And so now take your brush and do the second coat of the whole front of the body, the belly button. And are you doing big brushes up and down or are you going sideways? Cover your whole front of the body. It is loving, gentle, you know, grateful that our bodies, no matter how painful they are, how old, how whatever, they're working so hard, all these parts of our bodies. And take the brush now to the back, the right side of the scapula just move that awareness from the upper back to the middle back on the right side if you haven't done the side of your body make sure that you're brushing that with awareness 
And then the lower back. And if it's pain or itchiness or hotness, you're just like, oh, just gonna paint over this with awareness. Just really feel what's present. Move to the other side. And see how fast you wanna go with this brush. Are you gonna do a quick soup? of the left side of the back or you're going to go a little bit slower the side of the body and when you're done start doing the second coat where you're going to go and do the whole back if you're going to be fancy go horizontally and see if you can feel that But going up or sideways is a little bit easier. Just cover your back with awareness. Should you go around your waist? Paint the genital area, the right butt side, the left glute area as, as it supports our body. What does it feel like to bring awareness? You can have in the background the rest of the body. Right now we're gonna do the right leg, the upper leg. This time we're gonna do horizontal, so go sideways, as opposed to the length of the upper leg. Let's see if you can paint the stuff that's not touching the cushion or the chair because right, you can't get underneath the chair at the moment. We'll do that later. Do some circles of this paintbrush on your knee. Now switch to the other leg. What are the sensations on the upper part of the leg? So you're feeling the surface of this body that we have. Paint your left knee, awareness. Now we do the, the parts that are touching a brush, see if you can slide that awareness on the right side with everything that is touching the cushion, the chair, go to the other side for the other leg. Just calming, you know, with beautiful time that we're in community without having to be anybody or do anything. Now the right shin, and the lower part of the right leg is now going to be painted with this awareness brush. See if you can identify that which is not touching a cushion and that part that is. If you're sitting on a chair, be really aware of the clothing that is touching the skin. And now give the second coat to the leg. We're just sweeping awareness 
So about every little bit, like how about that crease behind the knee? But if you were to go in there with awareness and put that, poke that brush in there, what, what are the feelings? What are the sensations? to the other leg. Give a second coat of awareness. Same place behind the knee. What other sensations felt? You know, the upper part of your foot on the right side, you see your right foot. You're gonna get in between the toes and every toe is gonna to be painted. The sole of your foot, the back, the heel. And you know what's coming, give it a second coat. So whatever is touching the cushion, if you're sitting down, it's touching the floor. And we finish with the other foot, where we top of the, the foot, in between the toes, the toenails, everything is being painted with this brush. And then the sole of the foot. And now this is gonna be fun. Third coat for the whole body. Start wherever you want. Could be the fingers, it could be the top of the head, it could be the back. Start at some point and paint your whole body with a third coat of awareness. Let's see how fast you wanna go or how slow. And just do a sweeping of the whole body with this brush. Are you doing little strokes when you're painting? Are you doing big sweeps? As we're painting this shell, that which is in contact with the air element. Move your awareness. It could be up and down from the front to the front side of the body first, or you can do the back side. I'm gonna take a few moments for those people that are doing slow painting to finish their third coat. And then we're going to move inside. So just do a final awareness of the outside of the body, meaning the skin, wherever your hair touches, if you've got hair. And a gentle thank you to our skin or the protection that it provides, the information that it gives us when there's pain so we can alert it if there's a bruise or a cut, the sweat glands that come out so that we can be cool in the summer, all the protection that it gives. We're just gonna say thank you to our skeleton. All of us have these skulls, but we've never seen them. You know, maybe an x-ray somewhere, but as if you could imagine that we know that we've got this skull. 
there's not really a feeling that we can get. How many people are like, oh, I'm gonna sit and think, give thanks to my skull for protecting my brain. <laughs> so let's do that for a second. How complex all that is. And think about the teeth that you have, whether they're real teeth or not, the ones that are gone. If you've got fillings or braces, how the jaw is feeling, the whole element of solidity of the earth as we have it in our skull. And our spine. Let's do a thank you to the vertebrae, starting from the top all the way down to a coccyx, this little fake tail that we've got. Just imagine, right? Let's just think what they might look like. Some people might have some that are fused. What would that spinal cord look like? I don't know the anatomical names for the bones, but look at your shoulder area and that structure. And as, as we think as old biology posters, anatomy posters, I mean, so look at your upper arms that we've got those bones. The bones in our forearms. And just think of the complex, beautiful structure of your right hand, those bones. We can't really feel them as such, but when we break one, you know it's there, so. And the left side, those bones, The solidity of the earth element felt on the left hand. Take your pointer finger on the right hand. Just imagine all the little bones that are there. So give, give the fingers of your left hand It's a thankful attitude for having those bones, if you have them, right? Now move to your nails. Again, it's like we clip them, some people paint them. But is there any information that we get from this area of the body? Just a little thank you, they scratch, they do things for us. Going back to the neck area, as we move to our rib cage, just imagine that you could talk to your upper right rib. Sorry if you're a doctor, you know, if it has a number, a specific name, but it's have fun just to think that we've got these ribs. And then move to the left side, that upper rib. And just taking this imaginary trip down our ribs feeling the structure as they protect the organs. If you could see that X-ray, the upper body, the lack of bones in the tummy area, is that felt? Can you tell the difference between having a rib cage 
Imagine if you had a rib cage in your belly. Would that feel different? Notice the difference between having a rib cage and not that lower part and the upper part of the inside of us. Is that something that you're aware of, that there is a rib cage and the part in no rib cage in the middle? What is the difference? And as we go to the sitting bones and that structure keeps us upright. And now come some of the longest, longest bones in the body. Got a femur. And think of all the bones that are in the upper part of the leg. There's cartilage and there's the knee structure. Give a shout out in gratitude to the bones in the lower part of the right leg. And now we go to another complex area, the foot. All the bones on the foot. What comes to mind when you think of the bones of the foot? Do you go straight to the toes? And again, it's like remembering photos or illustrations of what a skeleton looks like, maybe a Halloween skeleton, and knowing that that's inside of us. As we move to the left side, what would that bone look like outside of our body? Give it a thanks. It helps, it helps us walk. Structure in the lower part, of the left leg. And all the bones and the left foot. giving a final sweep of our skeleton. Then with your imagination, your heart, the size of your fist, do you know where it's beating? Is that available to you? to actually know where the heart is. I'm not asking you to feel it. I'm just asking at the moment you're aware of any kind of activity in the heart. We would to the circulation system. Blood is being pumped. These veins that look like roots look like lightning. See if you can take a trip giving thanks to your arteries. So from your heart, go up your head and your face, knowing that blood is being moved. And you're not doing anything. The body is doing all that work for us. T cells and red cells doing their stuff. And think of all the blood going into all those channels, these veins, to your right arm, the left arm, knowing that the element of water is all over this body, and part of it is this blood. Oh, it's life. I think of this connection from the heart all the way in the middle body and the right leg, 
all the way to your feet. I'm not asking you to feel anything, just know that you've got the system. Just a thankful, imaginative thing on the left side. There are all these all these veins sending blood so that we can experience life. The nervous system, the vagus nerve, which is the longest one. An amazing, weird thing, these nerves that give us so much information. We get so annoyed with the pain that sometimes we feel. We're just giving our nervous system that is dealing with generational stuff, environmental stuff. So we've got this brain. And so from the brain, think of now these roots, highly sensitive, sophisticated things called nerves. Where would they be in your upper part, of the body? Coexisting with the veins, giving blood. Take that trip and the right arm to our right hand, left arm. In many ways, it would be a lot easier if we didn't have this nervous system. It would just be numb and we feel very quiet and neutral. So we have to deal with these nerves. Sometimes they get pinched. And move that Awareness to the middle of your body and then all the way in the right leg, all the way to the right foot. Honoring the nervous system on the right side and honoring the nervous system on the left side. And step out a second and see the whole structure of your brain and your nervous system working for you saying thank you. Just simple loving awareness that this great structure is here. In Buddhist lore, there's also the body awareness of how unpleasant it all is. You know, if we open up, it's going to be smelly. But there's also beauty. If you think of your stomach area, how many times do we give a thought to our spleen? And if you've got healthy kidneys, just imagining what size would the kidneys look? What kind of color are they? We don't know. We don't know them, you know? And if you're missing one, you definitely know that it's missing one. If you have dialysis, right? The liver. You have a sense of where that is. It's long intestines. Isn't that weird? We've got all these intestines in there. How are they all just kind of in there doing their thing? Gallbladder, all these things that are inside us. Soft part, the vulnerable part of our body. The traditional methods of mindfulness is the rising and falling of the abdomen.
finish the organ meditation with our lungs. This is not an exhaustive complete with every organ and every structure. See if you can get in touch with the upper part of your right lung. Where is that in awareness, if at all? The middle part of your right lung, left part of your lung. And we move on to the upper side of the other lung. Just being aware that it's that we have it, if you have it. Right? I think most people have two lungs. The middle, the lower part of the other lung. See that paint that we were using for the outdoors? I'm gonna make a little hole on top of your head and just start filling in. What would it be like to start filling in the inside of your body? with paint, filling in that shell, where would it go? So imagine that this magic paint can go through all the organs. What would it feel like as it goes filling in the head, the neck, feeling all the inside, spreads into the arms and the hands, goes all the way down the legs. And we end with the subtle body, with the energy body. Now that we know we're breathing, Can you get any information of what is energetically happening? In India, they'll talk about the seven chakras or chakras as they're pronounced in America. You've seen one of those charts of acupuncture. All the points where energy is moving. So pay attention to your body as, as it exists as energy. This takes more training and more experience to pay attention to energy, but it's possible. And with that, we finish this awareness of the body and move on to the bodies that are in the room. Everyone who's here is supporting you. You support me by being here. See if you can remember where someone is sitting. Did you notice another person and where they sit? Aware that they've got their own bodies, their own sensations. And even if you don't know their name, Send them a big paint bucket of compassion and well-wishing so that they may be aware and joyful and healthy. And wishing that to all sentient beings.
Feel free to stretch a little bit or stand or move. I've never led that paintbrush meditation. Was that weird? Yeah. I'm going to ask for a vote. You know, I'm a high school teacher. So this is how I get information from my high school, which is like, one, you hated it. You didn't make any sense. Five, it was fantastic. Three, it's just okay. Can I just see some fingers and the paint thing? Okay. Um, like I said, you know, I... I'm 52 and I started meditating when I was 16. And so the waves of what I do with my practice changes. And, and I think being playful and being curious has been really helpful for me. And so that's what I'm doing at the moment. I'm kind of like, I'm going to paint my body with awareness. I don't know where that came from, but it's working at the moment, you know, and, uh, and I'm also doing some, what's called concentration practice, yeah. which I never like that translation but before we start i want you to um find someone in the room that you don't know that well and say your name and uh and spend three minutes just just asking them like like why are you here today because you always come just sort of introduce yourself say your name and uh sort of like what brings you here today so i'm going to give you three minutes so you have a minute and a half each 7.45, I'm going to rate, I'm a teacher, I'm sorry, I'm like a high school teacher. I'm just gonna raise my hand and if you see me, then you raise your hand and then we know it's the time to, to share the sharing. So we have three minutes, mini share, introduce yourself, go. And if you're at home, feel free to journal or take a little walk. So my hope, you know, if you see this person you didn't know before uh, when you come in, as we say community, say hello. And if you forget their name, just ask again. Okay. Okay. The same. Ah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, when Shelly, you know, they're like, oh, come and do Sunday, you know, and I'm only here for one weekend. So I'm giving the weekend to my family. I didn't want to. Like, no, I'll do the little Thursday. It's great. Um, does anybody know the title of this talk? Was it given title? I'm kind of glad because I, I sent this weird title. <laughs> and I don't know if it was ever put on that thing. Um, no, well, you know, I, again, usually when I talk, are things that I'm currently working with because. One of my titles is art teacher, but at the depth of my core, I don't think that art can be taught. You know, philosophically, like I can teach a, a technique, like this is what you do with clay. I, but art, you know, it's a big word, right? So the Dharma, the same thing, like Dharma teacher, I'm like, eh. I don't, you know, like, eh. um, so I, I, I see myself as a Dharma sharer. Or, you know, and, and I, I usually explain it like when you've seen a really good movie, like I saw Tar on the way over here. I'm like, oh my God, Kate Blanchett, girl, that performance, you know, I'm like, I'm recommending to you Tar as a performance. Okay. And I think the Dharma can be like that as you, as you practice and you get benefit from it. There's something much more alive to talk about something that you're being experienced or you're curious about as, as opposed to being like a, catechism teacher you know where you are explaining and there's nothing wrong with that actually sometimes that's exactly what needs to be heard is some of the the background and i'm not but if that's the only thing you do then it becomes really dry and brittle and just kind of like just in the head so um for those of you that are new to the dharma this is not maybe not going to make a lot of sense. But I also feel that sometimes the Dharma talks are always at the beginning level. And then people that have been practicing a lot never get anything new. 
because you're kind of like we're going to talk about meta again <laughs> you know <laughs> because meta is in some ways it's easy to teach you know there's loving kindness even though it gets sought um from a commentarial uh, type you know there's the the meta sutta and then there's all these other things on how to, to teach loving kindness so because i've told you i'm a teacher i'm going to make you repeat uh these words so can everyone say paticha samu pada paticha samu pada paticha samu pada hmm. you might forget about it um for today but i have studied other religions um the Catholic mystics, uh, uh, Catholic liberation theology. I don't have negative connotations with Catholicism in El Salvador, where I'm from. The Jesuits that taught me were amazing. And the nuns that I knew were kind. So I don't have any mean nuns. I don't have any abuse. I don't have any, I mean, my associations with Catholicism are beautiful, okay? Virgin Mary, love her. <laughs> Jesus, I, I don't know, I've never, anyway. You know, in college, I took a year of Indian religions while I was living in England. So Sikhism, Hinduism, a uh, bit of Islam in India and Buddhism, a bit of Mahayana reading, you know, and all the, yes, yeah, so different kinds of religions. And Many of the things that we do in this tradition, in the Theravada and early Buddhism, you will find other places. The Avada Patimoka says, do good, refrain from wrong, purify the mind. This is the teaching of all Buddhas. It's just also the teaching of a lot of other religions. Do good, refrain from wrong, purify the mind. But Paticca Samuppada is the one thing that I, I haven't found in other religions. The way I see it is the explanation of the second noble truth. So first noble truth, there's dukkha. And the second noble truth is the cause. And this dependent origination is one of the translations. There's other translations. And the reason why I'm sharing it with you is because um, many times it's, it's not taught. And it's because there's controversies and there's theological, if there was theological arguments around it. And it's very complicated. But I'm like, people should know that it's there. Because what if you become curious? In the scriptures, it's 12 links of when the meeting of the senses and the object, when there's this meeting, there's a chain reaction that will happen to how suffering happens, right? So one of the controversies is that um, dependent origination happens in three lifetimes. So it's your past life, your current life, and your next life. So that already will, with people that have a European-based um, culture, do I have to believe in a past life in order to get Paticca Sampada? Already you begin, in the, you, you can go into this whole thing. So I've read whole books on the debate of it is three lifetimes. And these authors will say, Paticca Samuppada is about three lifetimes, period. And this is the evidence. Which is interesting because if you look at the scriptures, sometimes Paticca Samuppada doesn't even have 12 links. It has nine. You know, or you look at the way Tibetans will explain it. But this Paticca Samuppada also talks about avicca in a way that is very interesting. It's ignorance. And it could be the primordial ignorance. Again, in, in mystic Christianity, the original sin would be not that you're bad. First of all, sin is a, comes from the Greek, which is just missing the mark from archery. So when you sin, it's like, oops, didn't hit, and hit somewhere else. And when you repent, it just, it, it just meant you turn around, right? And so with avicca, it all starts with this. The system of suffering <clears throat> starts because we have ignorance. And <clears throat> as we have this, it, you know, it, it becomes in ignorance 
and then you go suffering and then you start the cycle of rebirth. If you go into psychoanalytic language, you can also go into, you repeat the same mistakes. And whatever background you have as a child, that's a past life to me. When I was three years old, things happened to me. It wasn't my fault, but I also know that somebody fed me. And because that fed me, my brain developed in a certain way. And so my karma, in, in Buddhist terms, not in the English dictionary explanation of karma, is that there is these lifetimes that I experienced. So when I was a teenager, I looked differently. My thoughts were different. My emotions were different. It's a past life, right? So I grew up in a civil war that had certain, that's a past life. Now I'm living in Australia where it's winter. And they drive on the other side of the thing and they have different money and they have these accents, right? That's like, I'm living a different life now. And I started, this is the first time I'm like, I want to show great because people are like, oh, you look younger. I'm like, I just want to look my age. I don't, you know, anyway. So this Paticca Samupada, what I love about it is that it really goes into also the eye makes contact with this visual stimuli, what's going to happen with that? Will you always be tied to, I'm looking for beautiful things. I'm avoiding ugly things. What are the patterns? So even at that superficial level, you go into various the sounds. Ajahn Chah, my teacher's teacher, used to say, don't bother the sound when you're meditating. And that's been a really important teaching for me. Because when I take the train, Melbourne is a multicultural, vibrant, crowded city. And the trains, just like tons of people. And same as in San Francisco, when I was there, that I can get very calm because I'm not bothering the noise. And I wanted to mention Paticca Sampada because in the scriptures, it also, um, the Buddha is quoted in the scriptures as saying, if you understand Paticca Sampada, you understand the Dhamma. And in some, you know, in some places in Thailand, in some places say that if you break one of the 12 links, you're enlightened, like any of them. And, you know, and it goes into, into okay, so I have this contact. And then as you go through the links, it can also look sequential, but experientially, ontologically, right? Ontology, this, this branch of philosophy where it's like, what's real, what's not real? What, what does it mean to be? What does it mean to be? You know, in post-Einstein science, they're saying, you know, the world is a bit of an illusion. Well, in Buddhism, they've been saying that. In Hinduism, they've been saying that. You know, and what does that mean in, a, in an experiential thing? It looks very real, but dependent origination is something that, um, you can intellectually think about it, going through the arguments, but it's just something to chew on, masticate, like, okay, well, what is this teaching? And as you start looking at it, there might be something in there that makes sense to you. That's the first thing I wanted to mention, that Paticca Sampada exists. And that um, it's very rich, it's very nuanced. And many times it's presented as an advanced teaching. And so it doesn't get taught because teachers don't feel confident going to the 12 Nidanas, you know, like when you go in, there's whole books analyzing each of the 12 links. There's a big painting with a Lord of death holding the, the wheel of this. And in the middle, there's a snake and a pig and a rooster, and that's greed, hatred, and delusion. And that's how the whole wheel is moving. And it can get so incredibly complicated, right? And if you're a scholar, you can totally get into it. Um, but to go back into this thing of there is contact and the end of it is that you go back into the cycle of rebirth and then pain, grief, and despair, old age, sickness, like it goes into this whole cycle of suffering. And so by, look, by studying this, 
it's the science, it's the science, it's the um, meticulously looking at how the process of suffering happens. I haven't seen that in other religions, it's pretty wild. I mean, it's, it's very, it's astonishing how uh, there's a beauty to it when you can say there's suffering, nothing special about it, everybody feels it, you suffer, you suffer, you suffer. Like, I don't know you, but I know you suffer, you suffer, right? Like, it's just, that's just like, the King of England suffers, Lady Gaga suffers. Like, it's just, it's just the most mundane thing. And then there's death, which is also the most mundane thing. But I was telling someone that we got this financial planner as a package for, you know, my husband's job. And like, okay, free financial planner. And he kept talking about, heaven forbid something were to happen are you ready to, and i'm like what is this heaven that is forbidding me? i'm like are you talking about death and so for the second meeting i said can you please use the word death and he said he kind of chuckles and he goes you know 99.99 percent of my clients do not want to hear the word death and i was like oh i'm the 0.01 and this is the one thing that we share like it's concrete it's not something that heaven will forbid <laughs> heaven forbid something were to happen like what and um so i just i'm just putting that and i was like what can i teach with the teacher so because this is the first time first time that i'm teaching the brushing and also the first time that i that i've really i've mentioned patricia some of in some of my dhamma talks but um, I've been scared too because of all the controversies, honestly. There are so many opinions about it. And so as you look into it, be curious, you know, if, if you're interested and if you're not, fine. But I think that um, it's a teaching that um, that's beautiful, okay? Because the third noble truth is, hey, there's an end of suffering, okay? What does that mean? You know, the coolness of Niroda. And then the fourth one is the Noble Eightfold Path. So it's presented in Ayurvedic medicine terms. You know, there's a sickness, there's the cause, the prognosis, and then the, the treatment. Um, and so the second thing I want to talk about, by the way, the title I gave Shelley. Hmm. But, you know, I want to talk about these complex things that people don't talk about. How about if I call it the simple complexity and the complex simplicity of Dharma practice? <laughs> she was like, what? Like, yeah, it could mean anything. But as you, as you move into spiritual practice, it can either be a labyrinth where you keep moving or it feels like a maze where you're feeling, right? And so the, the hope is that you keep moving and moving around without finding that because spiritual practice has those things that it's so simple. Like so be kind. But I led a whole evening and pulling apart kindness, not simple. What what is that? Is it Minnesota nice? Is it, you know, what how can you be kind if you've never been shown kindness? right can you and maybe you can like is it just what you can you know is like to me for example one of the most interesting ways of looking at kindness is that if you follow the five precepts like that's a definition of kindness you're not murdering you're not stealing you're not using your verbal stuff you know you're not ingesting things that will toxify your body you're not using your sexual energy to hurt yourself or others if you were to follow that you'll be quite kind without having to be like i'm sorry you're so mean you know what i mean like here's some cookies i've been given gifts with, with one guy one of the works that people at work you know, presented this gift and it was weird right so like gift giving Dana is like, give it at the right time to the right person. 
you know, with the right intention. So how do you do that? And um, so I wanted to say that as you move, whether you've been practicing 15 years or 15 days, to keep it simple and to know that it's complex, how do we do that? Right. Like I've been counting my steps now for about five years, because that's what I've been doing for five years. I walk around and I count to eight, and I count to seven, and I count to six, and I'm constantly doing things where I'm practicing throughout the day so that when I sit, silence or non-thinking is not something that I'm expecting to happen just like that. I think that's one of the dangers of instant meditation or presenting meditation as one more thing you have to do or meditation is the thing that will cure your anxiety and blah, 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 is that you have your world, your stress, and then you're supposed to sit. It's hard. It's not pleasant. You know what I mean? Like meditation can be really hard if, if, you're, if your life is like, ah. But if you're training throughout, then um, you can experience calm. How many of you know the word jhana? Can you raise your hand? One, two. Okay. So, oh. no, jhana became chan in Chinese, and it became zen in Japanese. So actually, the, the root word of zen is jhana. And it's the explanation of the eighth part of the Noble Eightfold Part of Sama Samadhi. Controversial. Not a Buddhist thing. So when you look at the Noble Eightfold Path, apart from right view and right intention, which are philosophically quite nuanced in Buddhism, you know, right speech, I mean, right mindfulness is not sati. The Buddha did not invent mindfulness. He didn't invent enlightenment. Like I think being awake is quite, quite rare, but I'm also 100% conf um, convinced the people that maybe lived in Nigeria or in El Salvador or in Chile or in Alaska, that they also experienced awakening. You know, the Buddha does not hold a patent on awakening. And so the jhanas, St. Teresa of Avila is one of my heroes. I went to Avila last year, Spanish nun, middle of the Inquisition, Jewish family, she had to her grandpa and dad had to convert because of the horrible stuff that was going in Spain. But she used to do the jhanas, which are the meditative absorptions. And there's eight of them, the four material jhanas and the four immaterial jhanas. And the way she explains them is with Christian language. And the way Hindus explain it is with Hindu's language. So in the stories of the Buddha, he did it when he was 12 years old under a tree. And then he did it again when he was uh, with his teachers. And when he got to the eighth jhana, the, the absorption, they're like, oh, you can be a teacher with us. And he's like, no, there's something more. So jhana is controversial um, with a few things. So I'm going to give you an intro. For example, in Sri Lanka, there was a time when everybody said, nobody can do this. It was this German nun, Ayakema who wanted to teach the jhanas and she got in trouble. Like people were persecuting her. Um, other people will say, don't teach the jhanas. People will become attached. Like they will say that to you. Or like, oh, it's like being attached to heaven. So don't teach the jhanas. I'm like, if you're going to get attached to something, <laughs> a meditative absorption is better than gambling or, you know what I mean? Like anyway, um, there are people who think that you cannot get enlightened unless you have the jhanas. So there's, there's these statements that get made about Paticca Sampada and the jhanas. This is what they have come on that are very like wrong. And um, if you have an understanding that's in the head, then you can go into these arguments. But basically, as your body um, feels silence and uh, for example, some monks in the Ajahn Brahm tradition in, in Australia will say, 
Let's say that you could do a hundred breaths without any thoughts when you're ready for jhana. And a hundred was just a, a number that came, but it, you know, if you could sustain that, um, then you're ready. Or if you feel piti, and piti is a delight. It's a sensation in the body where your body feels delightful. And um, the other thing that people say why you shouldn't talk about jhanas is because then people will be so goal oriented that it becomes counterproductive. That you haven't meditated ever and then all of a sudden you're demanding that jhanas happen. So usually is something that can take weeks, months, years with humility and without craving, you open yourself to this. So they're rare, but now you can go to Spirit Rock and go to a jhana retreat. Or you can, um, it's interesting that I, see that the universe is interesting. I moved to Australia. I'm staying at this rented place with, before we move in. And I've been thinking a lot about the jhana and Paticca Samupada, and I'm like, I need to read something else, somebody who has really practiced with these two things because I can't find a lot of people. And all of a sudden I get an email. Hey, I got your name from so-and-so and I'm a practitioner in Sydney. I'm in Melbourne for two days. Want to meet up? I'm like, yeah, come for lunch. So we sat for half an hour, walked around the botanic garden. And he goes, you know, I heard about Dhamma and I said, you know, I'm interested in the Janice. Oh, you saw this, this is right. A guy named Rob and so and this guy has been teaching both things. And so now I'm listening to his talk and listening and for somebody who has been, he died of um, cancer, but he taught the jhanas and taught Paticca Samupada. So I just wanted to share that with you, that these two things um, are here in, in the jhanas. The first jhana is basically you have a pattern is vitaka, vichara, piti, sukha, ekagata are the five things that will happen. And so one is you put a, you put an attention in your meditation, and this is where it gets con translated as concentration. And I've never liked that word because I think of like math problems or like concentrating, like narrowing your your focus on something. And this kind of attention is more you know, it, it, it is a focusing perhaps, but it, it's more like, okay, I'm gonna do the breath or do this. Nimitta can happen, which is uh, sometimes people can see a light or, you know, things can happen. And at this point, if you haven't been meditating for a long time, it can be scary to not feel the breath or to not hear thoughts, right? Because most human beings, they, it's a constant chatter up here. So what happens, who are you when there's no thought? and then the breath is subtle, this fear can come up. But if you go through this, then you get piti, which is this delight and like Ajahn Brahm, this, this monk and say, it's better than any orgasm you can think of. And I'm like, well, no wonder people wanna get it right away. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, okay, it's free and it doesn't give you side effects like a drug. But you can imagine if you are in a capitalist, greedy culture, that's what we breathe. If somebody tells you that there's this thing that is better than our orgasm that you can get while meditating, you can see how people be like, oh, people are going to get all greedy. Okay, fair enough. But I think, so don't do that. But just know that um, with meditative absorptions, the, the first four um, are not as subtle as I don't have experience for that immaterial ones where the body is no longer felt. But if you go to Rome, Bernini did a, a sculpture of St. Teresa of Avila doing things, and, and it does look like she's having an orgasm, just like, you know, with this angel piercing her heart. Because so it can be a very strong um, energy. And the PT, you've heard of the Shakers and the Quakers? You know, the guy with the Quaker oats? He used to quake and shake, you know, Holy Spirit. And that would be, you know, it, it's energy in the body. But if you channel that a little bit more, you can, you can feel delight. So it's 8.15. Talk to the person you met today and see if you have any questions or disagreements or things that I've said. So three minutes. 
what's coming up for you with all this stuff that I'm just basically have given you bullet points and big teachings. What's kind of a lie for you? I'm like, you can say I was totally bored, right? Or you can say, oh, I'm curious about this. So let's do three minutes of uh, what are you getting out of this or what are your reactions? Or any questions that are coming up for you? And if you are online, if you have any questions, you can uh, text them now. Yeah. Okay, um, so for this part, is there something that you heard somebody say to you? So from your partner that you think might be good for the whole group to hear. So I'm asking if you heard a comment or a question or a reflection. And it's okay if there isn't, but I'm just wondering, um, go ahead. Um, what did you hear? That might be interesting for all of us to ponder on. Hello. Hi, um, I think from the person that I talked to, it was curiosity. More mm -hmm. than like, how to spell curiosity. Mm -hmm. How to spell the black thing and the black thing. Right? Teach us some part, uh, right? yeah. how to look up and get perspectives and viewpoints. Perspectives and viewpoints. Oh, I'm repeating right? because they can't hear you, Ben. Oh, okay. <laughs> In the jhana, okay. More knowledge. More knowledge, yeah. Information Yeah, have more exposure. Okay, yeah. thank you. And, you know, I remember I was on the bus and thinking, oh, I wanna, how would you explain Paticha? How do you make people? And I thought of Patty doing the cha cha. And I was like, Paticha <laughs> doing cha cha with Sam. Paticha, some, and I don't know what Pada was. <laughs> it's like, Eating pad thai, but I'm like you know because because when you look it up, but it actually if you Google dependent origination, you will get um, the stuff, and you know maybe Common Ground could do a study group because I'm telling you the opinion, um, yeah. Anyone else heard something that might be interesting? We've got ten minutes, seven minutes, yeah. Um, my partner there um, came from a Christian religion. And, mm -hmm. Someone came from the Christian religion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, he said he came from here. So he had a son-in-law that is, came from a Buddhist tradition. Mm -hmm. And there was something about his character, you know, like calmness. And so, um, and I just noticed that practice, you know, you change, you soften up a little bit. Yeah. That the practice shows up. Mm -hmm. Noticing how the, the, the practice can soften how someone lives in the world, how it changes you, kind of thing. Is that okay? Um, any questions just from anybody? Not what you heard, but is there anything that you would like clarification on? Mm -hmm. or from online? Mm -hmm. Something the that they're from New England and the Shakers are shaking Quakers. Not sure whether Quakers So Quakers didn't quake? <laughs> okay. Um, and, I mean, it's interesting. Like, you know, I remember seeing the Hare Krishnas going into this kind of like, you know, where, where the body's in that. And, and I mentioned the, the mudras, the hand postures, because my body was just having so much energy. And all of a sudden, my hands went into this thing and I would look and it would be like these traditional mudras that already exist. This is before, now you can get mudra cards. You can get mudra books, you can get, but you know, sometimes I would open my eye and I would be like, oh, interesting. You know, like they, they would be start doing this because the energy would leave my finger. So it's interesting how, um, you know, truth is truth. It's not Christian or Buddhist or whatever. There's wrong views. The first scripture of the long discourse is really fun because it's it's got a list of wrong views. Um, my favorite wrong view is when there's a God who creates universes and then the beings in the universe worship the God and then the God thinks that he's permanent. <laughs> and that's the wrong view. And I'm like, listen to that. <laughs> um, because India has this expansive thinking in their scriptures. Like there's a painting that I have of Vishnu 
God Vishnu sleeping. And out of every pore, a universe is being created. You know, it's just like, in all these worlds and all these beings, it's like, where eon is defined in a, as a long time. And it's when a bird is a piece of silk in its beak. And once in a hundred years, it goes and it goes like this on Mount Everest. So an eon is how long it takes for Mount Everest to be at sea level, being worn down with a piece of silk from a bird once every hundred years. <laughs> right? I mean, it's like, whoa! <laughs> I mean, I just love that kind of thinking. And, and it is kind of most Einstein, um, little scientists go crazy when very casually religious types will say, yeah, it's, you know, it's like this kind of physics, or, you know, just casually, but but it is interesting how um, it's matching up. So to finish up, I just want to say um, that to encourage somebody in a spiritual path is not easy because people, you know, in a group, people need different things. But one of the teachings that I used to love is like sometimes you have to go left, right? But what if I'm giving you the directions and I'm behind you? That changes. But then what if you are in a different kind of road? What if you're in Australia? You know, to go left or right has different things when you're driving. And so it's the context. So when you're in a group, um, sometimes the teaching is, you're taking it too easy. You need to put energy. You need to commit. But if you're in a culture where you're stressed out, you are driven, you are, what you value is accomplishment, that is not what you need to hear. That's what the Thai monks in Ajahn Chai, Northern Thailand, they're so relaxed. They needed to hear that. And then these white men came with that with a militaristic thing and tried to give it to the monks and it just didn't work. And they also had a patriarchy where it's so anti, non-male, basically, right? So the translation, but keeping it simple in the sense of, how are you going to give this curiosity? Curiosity is lovely because it gives you energy. And it's not one more thing you have to do. It's like, oh. And you know, when I played with, like, I remember maybe it was Titna Han or something like, you know, pay attention when you hear a phone. And, and so I was driving in San Francisco, which is so many stop signs. And like at every stop sign, I would breathe. And it never worked for me. It was like, this doesn't work. But I tried it for about a week where I'll be like, okay, stop sign, I'll breathe. I'm like, I just get annoyed. Not, this is not working. But the flexibility to say, you know, I gave it a try for two weeks and breathing at a stop sign is not my practice. But counting my steps is at the moment. You see, I'm constantly thinking of, and you know, the, the Catholic faith, we go like this. And so you have, may your thoughts, your emotions and your actions align. May the spiritual path, which is vertical and the path of the earth align. There's all these symbolisms. In the cross where you are naked, tortured in front of your mother, like you can't go any lower. And then you're the phoenix that rises. For centuries, the phoenix was important in Christianity. And that image of when you understand dukkha, when you understand the suffering, and then it's like, whoa, right? So you, you get the, like, you know, these things in, in all these traditions that kind of show you, like, what's going to bring delight? What's going to be, you know, becoming curious, keeping it simple, and knowing also that this stuff can be also quite nuanced and white, you know? How do we understand our karma? Don't go there. The Buddha gave some warnings. It's like, if you try to understand the first cause, for your karma, you'll go crazy. Stop it. So, you know, focus on what's useful. Dukkha. How do we make other people suffer? How do I make myself suffer? That's quite simple. And yet, you might need therapy. You might need to get out of therapy. It's absolutely, absolutely available. Absolutely available. So, I finish my talk with this little phrase. A lot of the time I finish my talks with a little phrase. Every time that you work towards your happiness, you're honoring everybody that has ever loved you. 
and you honor your ancestors. The people that have loved you, they want you to be happy. Yeah. And so as you work towards your happiness, it helps the world because happy people are not mean. <laughs> it's always an honor to sit here and I love this place. So I'm glad it's here and I'm, and I'm glad you can go to science. Thank you. Which part? The last, what do you say at the end? Can you say that again? Every time you work towards your happiness, you honor the ancestors and everybody that has ever loved you. Because the good ancestors wanted them to survive. I also believe, actually, that you heal the bad ancestors. <laughs> you know? Not every ancestor was good. 